Okay, so I'm just going to quickly talk you through some of the techniques that are um, used in this opening act and scene of Macbeth. Now we have the battlefield in thunder and lightning. Now this opening setting implies that the witches are involved in creating chaos, that we're, we're entering on a scene that itself visually implies chaos, and that the witches, who obviously are the, the only participants in the scene, are associated then with that particular type of chaos. The first witch then says, when shall we three meet again? Now, this is a case of a, a literary sort of technique called in medias res, which is obviously comes from Latin and it means in the middle of things. And what it really means is that we are joining the action as it's already unfolding. So we're, we're, we've turned up on a scene that is already happening and actually is already coming to its end. So it's the end of the meeting here between these three witches, which is why the first witch asks this question, when should we meet again? Which obviously conceals their discussion. It keeps it hidden, what they've actually talked about so far, which is designed by Shakespeare to provoke the audience to believe that the witches have full control over the events that are going to follow. What we're seeing is the end of a scene where we, we, we're invited to speculate, to think that what unfolds is because of what's gone on in this scene that we haven't actually been able to witness. And then she asked the question, in thunder, lightning, or in rain? This is a device called tricolon. It means three counts here of one, two, three, thunder, lightning, rain. All of those options are chaotic or tumultuous. Tumult means something that's chaotic and wild. Tumultuous is the adjective form of this, the adjectival form. The second which then says, when the hurly-burly is done, when the chaos is over, which obviously is quite a bizarre answer to this question because this question only lists options such as thunder, lightning or rain, which are, as we've said, all chaotic. And then the second which says they will only meet when this chaos is over, when the hurly-burly is done. When the battles lost and won is an oxymoron. It's a self-contradictory statement. How can the battle be lost and won at the same time? It can't in very simple logical terms. But here we can think of the possible connotations of this and, and of what this actually means in terms of their prediction for Macbeth. It could be when Macbeth's, we're talking about Macbeth's actual victory in battle, and the battle's lost and won by, you know, Norway, and then it's won by Scotland. But it could be, you know, the battle's lost for Macbeth's soul, and then won, or won and then lost. But it could be also Macbeth's victory of the crown as a, as a win, but then a lost battle because his fate is doomed. So lots of different possible ways of reading that highly ambiguous, uncertain meaning of that oxymoron the third which then says that will be ere the set of sun that will be before the setting of sun so again the literal meaning of that means soon when the battle's lost and won it will be quickly before the sun goes down on this day or when the setting of sun on the end of Macbeth's life but it could also then mean that when the sun sets is when the battle's lost and won, when something that we've predicted has already happened, and that that prediction, that prophecy, is going to take place within the, the passage of time of this single day. The, f the first which then asks, where the place upon the heath? Now the heath is a kind of open field, which is where they're often cast in movie adaptations of this. But this is a liminal space. To be liminal means to be on the boundary between things. So if you're a teenager, you are liminal in the sense that you are between childhood and adulthood. If you are, you know, when we described Curly's wife hovering in the doorway between the bunkhouse and the outside, 
that doorway is a liminal space. It is between things. It's between outside and inside. The heath is a liminal territory. It's, out, it's between wildness and society. It's between the battlefield and the king's quarters. And that implies that the witches operate outside of society. They're forced to move in different circles, to move in different places to those that people like Macbeth and the king can move in. And there's partly there a, 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 a sort of criticism of, of male-dominated society, of patriarchy, that this is what female characters are forced to do. You know, the witches are all female. Lady Macbeth is female. These characters in this play are forced into odd, unorthodox behavior because they have to operate outside of society. Upon the heath there to meet with Macbeth gives us this huge sense of control over him. And this is you know, what occurs in the play early on in Act 1, Scene 3, that they do meet with Macbeth. And that, that implies then that that moment in the play, the battle's already been lost and won. And that then gives us a huge sense of control of the witches over Macbeth's fate and over his destiny. The first witch and then the second witch says, I come, Grey Malkin. And then the second witch says, Paddock calls. Now, Grey Malkin is a cat, and Paddock is a kind of toad or a frog. But these are what are called attendant spirits. They're spirits, you know, as you see witches with cats quite frequently in normal representations of them. They're spirits protecting, helping, and serving the witches. So there's the suggestion then of these what are called attendant spirits calling the witches away. And then the third which says, Anon. And then this final couplet that ends this scene in true cryptic, obscure fashion, where we're unsure about the exact meaning of this, but there seem to be lots of possibilities. They all chant together, fair as foul and foul as fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. And this is one of the famous quotes from Macbeth. This uses a device called a chiasmus. Now, this is actually quite simple to understand, but obviously has a strange name. It's a rhetorical device. If you imagine fair is A and foul is B, you have A, B, B, A. The second half of the sentence mirrors the first, but in reverse. So where A is at the beginning, it's at the end of the second half. Where B is at the end, it's at the beginning of the second half. So you imagine it's almost like a sentence looking at itself in the mirror. It's reflected in reverse. A, B, B, A. Other famous examples of this are things like um, love the life you live and live the life you love. Um, do not ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. All of those are examples of chiasmi, the plural of chiasmus, a single example. Obviously what this does is tells us that these two things are the same. Fair is foul and foul is fair. But what this tells us is that the boundaries between good and bad are going to be blurred. What's fair is foul. What seems fair, perhaps Macbeth in the opening as a noble soldier, is going to be foul. And what's foul is actually fair. Things that are seemingly immoral, um, like perhaps the, the treachery of, of the Thane of Cawdor actually leads to something fair for Macbeth. The, the, fair, the fair, the positivity of him becoming Thane of Cawdor. Um, there's a number of other possibilities with this. Fair is foul. So things that appear to be moral are not so, and things that are not moral appear to be so. So there's a, again, there's this huge sense of uncertainty that this language creates. And then their final line suggests this gradual sort of disappearance of the witches, hovering through the fog and filthy air, becoming part of the spirit of the place. So these are the features of the language which give the witches this enormous sense of power, but also of ambiguity. They are deliberately cryptic and uh, mysterious, the lines that are created in the opening of the scene here.